Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God this morning, this hour. It could be afternoon, it could be evening, wherever you are. But we want to thank God. Let us pray. Loving Father, we have been lost, but you called us and found us and gathered us into your loving arms and led us into your heavenly sheepfold. Continue to guard us and guide us. Keep and protect us from all the perils and dangers of life. For we trust your word and we will praise you for your life and kindness and gracious mercies all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we are going to hear the reading of the Word of God that comes from the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22 to 39. I would ask Brother Ben to come and do the reading. Good morning and praise God this week. Um, it's a bit cooler here today. I was, had to put a tracksuit on this morning just to stay warm, which is a change and I've got my woolly coat on. Uh, as Johnson mentioned, I'll be reading from John 10, uh, verses 22 to 39. And it's about the religious leaders surround Jesus at the temple. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good works, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he calls them gods to whom the word of God came, then scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the Father sets apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am the father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Praise God. Be um very challenging if Jesus stood in front of you saying these things to um, us. But uh, we'll get Johnson back to see what message he's got for us this week, what God's put on his heart for us, and um, yeah, bring open ears. Praise the Lord. Uh, this um, time I've decided to share with you on the theme Life insurance is available, free, but not cheap. Life insurance is available, is free, but not cheap. It is reported that during the World War, a young bomber pilot, just before taking off on a critical mission, led a match in the presence of the chaplain, and after having blown it out, asked him, now tell me, man to man, is that all happens to us when we die? 
Is this all there is? So the question is as old as Job and before him. If a person died, can they live again? And we are back again to the question of what life is all about. What happens after death and indeed, what is the meaning of our existence? Questions for which answers come hard. Assurance is often shallow and all too often we left with that question. Still burning in our mouths as we bury a father, a mother, or husband, or wife, child, or a friend. Is this all there is? What is life? Look at your routine. Otherwise, you are just repeating certain things every day. Maybe you have breakfast in the morning. You shower, you go to work, you eat lunch, you come back home, you eat dinner, maybe you shower, you go to sleep, maybe at 8 or 10, depending who you are with your style. But are you not repeating everything every day? So what is the meaning of life? What is beyond all this repetition we are doing? Think about it. Think about your own life. Are you not repeating these things? We are strange people indeed. Living as we do in a land of affluence, where most of us want for very little. We feel compared to develop programs that will secure our futures. With the usual Australian in Genity, we have designed insurance programs that can cover almost every calamity we can name, and even some we can't. I've been hearing even people <laughs> accusing the leaders of the countries over natural disasters, natural calamities, like floods, COVID-19, fires, and all these things. And I asked it myself, who is in charge? Who is in control? Who knows about all these things? We fear for our futures. What will become of me? Where will I live? What is life all about anyway? But we also fear today, so we build funds and elaborate security systems around ourselves and around our possessions. There are security systems everywhere trying to secure what we have. It can be a tragic and sad life if we all see is here and now. And all our efforts must go into protecting the stuff we accumulate around us. Unfortunately, many people fail to grasp that life insurance policies can never really answer the best existential question that most of us wrestle with at some point time during our lives. What is life? But if there is a good news for us. Believe it or not, there is a life insurance plan available for you and me that is more comprehensive than any plan you could ever buy from an agent. There is a plan available for us that is written out so simple and clearly that a child can grasp it. Often before the parents ever can, and the best news of all is free. It's free. It is a plan that as you stand before open graves in the air cemeteries under green canopies, we read and listen from Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. I am the resurrection in the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives believes in me will never die. Which means life is not only about the possessions that we have. Life has got someone who owns it. And which means that you need to surrender your life to that person. You need to give your life to that very person because he is the owner of life. 
A life insurance plan that guarantees that life does not end. A life insurance plan that offers more security than you and I can ever imagine. More peace of mind now and for those left standing besides years after debt is piled on caskets. Here is the good news for us. Our God loves us so much that he sent his son. Jesus the Christ who died on the cross for us and rose to new life three days later so that we might have a new life now and in the future. So the life insurance plan is for free, is free for all of us. The premium is, was already paid by Jesus with his own life. It is not a cheap plan because it costed the son of God to go on the cross. So it's not a cheap plan. It's a very expensive plan. And that is one thing we need to know. It's an expensive thing we need to know. And we want to thank God for that. Because it's not a cheap thing for us to think of. It's not a cheap thing. It costs our Lord, but it is complete and comprehensive and free. And offered to all of us. So ask your question. Is this all there is? As for me, I live my life under God's life insurance plan. Not because it's free. But because God gave it to me, signed, sealed, and delivered by Jesus Christ to me because of his love, he shed the blood on the cross for me. Now I have trouble understanding why more people don't buy into this plan for their lives. And I'm not talking necessarily about people outside of the walls and fellowship of our churches. If they haven't accepted this good news, maybe it's more on our fault than theirs. Maybe we haven't told them the story clearly and plainly enough, or even often enough, for them to understand what we are talking about. Maybe we haven't lived the story we ourselves. They see us, we talk of love and fellowship and caring for one another. And then they see us fight over whether we should save wine or grape juice for communion. Or fighting over who is and who is out of the kingdom as if that is our decision. Or fight over which church is better than the other. They see us fighting over whether we like the pastor or not. Maybe we haven't lived the story we tell. We talk of love and live in an unlove. We talk of trust and live in quiet solitude. We talk of unity and live in division. But I can understand this. We are all sinners. And our fellowship will reflect that from time to time. We are all sinners. Saved by the grace of God. So we must work at this forgiveness and grace stuff. No, my problem is not with those outside there for whom the gospel, the good news is unclear. My problem is with those we have had yet failed to grasp the message which is clear to them and to share the message to everyone. To put it in the framework of this sermon, those who want to write their own life insurance plans because they can't or won't accept the one God offers them in Christ, somehow the good news can't be received as good news because we try to plan everything according to our own works. We try to provide security on our own problems, not with what God has provided us with. To put it even more plainly, I have trouble understanding why anyone would want to work out their own salvation, to work, sweat, and struggle, and fret get into the kingdom of God. We are saved by what we, he did, not by what we try to do. It's God's grace, his unconditional love for us. That is our life insurance plan. And we all have to do to have is accept it as the gift it is. Well, maybe that's our problem. We don't know how to accept gifts. Somewhere along the line, we are told that it's not polite to accept gifts without putting some kind of fuse. Oh no, I couldn't accept that. You shouldn't have 
And all the time, in the back of our minds, we are thinking, why is he doing this to me? Why am I getting this gift? We don't want to receive the gifts because we think, why? Does he think, does he look at me and feel I'm poor? Does he look at me that I, I, I'm disabled? Why is he giving me? What does he want from me? I would better be careful. There's got to be a string attached here somewhere. If I take this, then I'm going to have to give something back in return. And I really don't have the time to do go shopping. And on and on, our untrusting, selfish, little minds go on. We don't want to receive gifts. And it is the same. The gift that is coming your way is no strings attached. It's Jesus Christ. Why can't we be like children? If you ever see a child accept a gift, no re-aging here. Eyes lit up as if a thousand lies have been turned on in the head. Smile straight further than the limitations of face and ears would seem to allow. Eager hands reach out and acceptance immediately real wonderful. That's what I like from children. You give them the gift and you can see the smile. You can see their hands being stretched, wanting to receive. That is exactly what I expect from people. No complications, no internal racing, no guilt. Maybe we can take a lesson there as we get the good news offered to us. This is the good news that's being offered to us. You know, after reading the gospel from the lesson of John chapter 10, verse, verses 22 to 39, all over again this week, I discovered that people back in Jesus' time had trouble too with accepting who Jesus was. Here Jesus was walking around on Solomon's porch in the temple at Jerusalem on the day of the Feast of Dedication. It was in winter time. At this festive occasion called the Feast of Flies, Jesus was standing in this portico of the east side of the temple. And inquirers sought him out and asked him about whether he was the Messiah or not. It was not a question asked in honest sincerity or truth. He had been showing them all along and they still came and wanted more proof before they could accept it. And Jesus answered them, I have told you and you do not believe. The words that I do in my Father's name testify to me. Even if they have seen the miracles, even if they have seen the ways that the words were true, they never accepted it. They never received it. And there lies the tragedy which is unbelief. I have told you and you do not believe. Jesus has announced the good news in word and deed, in miracle, teaching on hillside and in temple, and still people could not believe it. They could not believe it. In contrast to those who wanted to make God's love something we must earn by adherence to law after law, ritual after ritual, Jesus claimed that God loved even the sinner. He loved even the sinner. It was the righteous, the religious of Jesus' day. We had trouble hearing that as good news. Those who think they are righteous had the problem of receiving as good. They had developed a whole system designed around earning God's love. That's why they could not accept people who were considered as sinners to receive the grace of God. They somehow could not grasp the truth that God was greater than their systems and more loving than they could ever imagine. So they rejected Jesus and his teaching. So what say you? We have heard the good news time and time again from this pulpit in the church. What say you? Maybe you need to hear the children sing again. Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. For the Bible tells me so. For there is the message as simple as the gift to us. Amen to that church. Jesus loves you. That is the only bottom line. Jesus loves you. So simple. Friend, may I remind you that you can play at this too long. Winter is coming for you. There will come a day when you won't be able to witness. If you are going to do anything for him, you better do it now. If you have never sincerely accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, may I remind you that winter can come for that too. There does come a time when it is too late, my beloved, too late to be saved. You can persist in rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ so long that finally you will be unable to accept him. 
The prophet spoke of this eventuality in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Time is not on our side. What does Jesus say on verse 27, on John 10, verse 27 and 28? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. In this grand statement, Jesus summarized the blessings of those who truly listen to and believe the gospel. If you listen and believe the gospel. So the believer in Jesus knows him personally. His eternal life will not perish and is secure in his care. So don't look for any other security for your life. The only security is in Jesus. But many of those who had him had no intention of true listening. Even if they had. Even some people may listen and hear what I'm saying. They will not accept what I'm saying. It is also true that those refusing to listen to Jesus' voice are not his sheep. We recognize Christ's voice when he speaks us through the Bible. Are we truly listening for it? Are we truly listening even for this message that is coming your way? Are you listening to it? In conclusion, is it possible for you to make a decision for Christ this very time? I mean a commitment to letting God be God in our lives. A commitment to remembering what really is the bottom line in life. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus reminds us to lay up treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, they will your heart be also. So I'm saying, brother, sister, it's high time you surrender fully your life to Christ because he's the savior of the world. Nothing. All the things that we have, all the things that we need, when you die, you don't take anything with you. All is left behind. All the securities you have put around your kingdom, around your own homes, around your own properties, it's meaningless. I've seen houses which were surrounded with walls being demolished in seconds. So our security is not in the things that we surround ourselves with. It's in Jesus Christ. May the good Lord be with you. May the good Lord continue to help you as you meditate upon this message. Think upon this message. It's high time you think about it and take it seriously. God bless you from now and evermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving Father, there have been times when we've questioned our eternal security in you. But you are God. You are good and faithful shepherd whose word is to be trusted forever. Thank you that you have held us securely in the hands of our Lord and our Savior, our God and our King. And that nothing can separate us from your wonderful presence. Thank you for our gift of eternal life. And the promise that nothing can snatch us from your hand and no one can separate us from your gracious love. Glory to your name forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now it's time for us to take our offering. And I just want you to Think about the things of this world. It could be the money that you have. It could be all the things that you have. That one day, you will go. You have put all your insurances. Even some have taken life insurances. 
but that does not protect you from dying. So it's better for you, brother and sister, to remember, just to thank God for the gift of life, that you are alive and you are able to do what you are doing for free. You are alive. You are alive for free. So you need to thank God. I know it might not even be enough to thank him what you are going to do, but I just want you to think about, about it. Let's pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, as we bring our offerings before you, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are God. We thank you for these offerings. We thank you that you continue to look after us. Bless our offerings, Father, as we give them to you. Without you, we don't have all these things that we have. All these things that we have belongs to you. We are only stewards of God's property. Thank you, Lord. Bless these offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's receive grace. Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious truth that Christ, in his humanity, demonstrated how we may live as you intended all your children to live. Help us to live in total dependence, joyful obedience, full of submission to your will and purpose in our life. Until, like the Apostle Paul, we say, it's not I that live in this body, but Christ who lives in me, in whose name I pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. See you very soon.